Friday, I don't have the hottest intro music in the podcast land. Shout out to my boy Silent J for putting it down, y'all. Thank y'all again for uh, watching another episode. Um, and thank y'all for, you know, when I'm walking down the street, you always say, man, P, I love your podcast, man. And remember, it's Pierre's Panic Room. It's not just a panic room. I work hard for my name on top of that, y'all. So come on, show me the love. I need the Pierre's Panic Room. Got to brand myself. Um, I'm excited about the show. Usually I read comments, man, but this time we're going to read the comments. We're going straight to the show, man, to the big, big thing, man. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button or notification bell. There you go, right there. And keep watching it, man. We're bringing some hot content, man. You've seen the link recently, man. We're bringing the hot facts. We're bringing, this is no different. This show is no different. Some of y'all may not know him, but as soon as you see him, like, ah, that's my man. And he got history, too, y'all. We ain't going to be able to cover everything because he got a lot. This man's been through a lot, and we here to, he's here to share it with us, man. Give a round of applause for the one and only Mr. Tom Morris Jr. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Brother, thank, thank you. you, man. Thank you. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, first of all, you look better than you looked on TV. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what years that was when you was on some of those shows. You look younger, man. You know, they had you in that old man suit, probably. That might be what it was, man. But you, uh, well, when I saw you, I was like, damn, this brother looking young, like, like you're 25 years old, 35 years old, damn near. Every decade's different. You okay. Know? okay. That's the thing. Okay. 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 And black don't crack. I know that's right. Unless you smoke don't crack. crack. I dare you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> he say black don't crack unless you smoke it. I don't smoke crack. All right. I'm, I'm 112 years old, man, if you didn't know that. <laughs> um, all right. Let's talk about, uh, we, got so, we got so much, man. I was doing the research. I was like, dude, I can't do a three-hour show now. I can't. I'm going to try to condense it. Mm -hmm. I know you got a lot of stuff, a lot of stories, man. Um, and to be honest with you, I would see the show every once in a while. You know, I was an avid viewer just because I have my career. I'm trying to get my hustle on. Mm -hmm. But I did watch it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, when I started reading your, your, your background, uh, they got the right person. They got the right person, brother. You know, knowledgeable. Just, just the strength of who you are, and what you've been through. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not an actor doing that. You know, you right. you've really been through some stuff. Right. So let's go back to um, your family structure. Growing up, with your mother and father in the house. Yes. And sister, so. Preacher's son, preacher's oh, okay. grandson, preacher's son, mm -hmm. preacher's nephew, oh, well, okay. preacher's brother. Okay. Uh, grew up Southern Baptist. My father uh, was from Virginia. My mom's from Virginia. I was born in Richmond, in a segregated hospital. You born. <laughs> You born in Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. But I saw something. What was that? Hypeville or Hyperville? What was what, that little town instead of you came from? Uh, Heathsville. Heathsville. Heathsville, Virginia. I know Virginia. And I never heard of Heathsville. Yeah, we were in Richmond when I was born. Okay. My father was at Virginia Union. Oh. Okay. Then he graduated, moved to Philadelphia to go to seminary to get his master's degree, and then when he finished that, he took a church in Cincinnati. So we moved okay. to Cincinnati. In 66, and okay. was there doing the riots and all that. And um, then in 72 or 71, he took a church back down in the rural area of Virginia where he originally came from, which was Heathsville, a church called Shallow Baptist Church. Oh, okay, okay. So you're a, you're a, a preacher's kid. Yes, PK. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, my father became a pastor later on in life, mm. like when he was 70, I guess, after all the demons, mm. you know, he did all his, his shit, <laughs> gangsters and shooting and women and all that kind in of stuff. In the fourth Perkins. quarter. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. You know, he, he, he wanted to get in. He, he, wanted, he wanted to get in, mm. you know what I'm yeah. saying? So I don't technically call myself a preacher's kid, but I am, you uh -huh. know. Um, but that's, that's um, it's funny. I'm going to tell you something funny. I grew up in Germany. Then we moved to D.C. My parents separated, so it was me and my father. He married a woman who was big into the church, had two daughters. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about church. My mother wasn't into that kind. She was more into voodoo. We used to have a what was that, Ouija board and shit. My uh -huh. mom was yeah. off the chain. Um, and so when I got to the, the church, I had, a, I had a misunderstanding. I thought everybody in church was good and just nice. You know, you know. <laughs> I thought I was the demon in there. You know what I'm saying? And, but girls were trying to holler at me, man. I'm like, right. are you trying to talk to me? You in church? How, how, this, ain't, this ain't how you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and and I always had a is it a quandary? I, I didn't understand it. You know, like I thought you're supposed to be a certain way in church and not this. I thought, um, did you ever have grown in? Is it easy when you grow up in that church? You don't feel that way because I was well, confused. When you're a preacher's son from birth, mm -hmm. like me, you're under a different microscope to begin with. Okay, so everybody expects you to be good and right. not to be a normal teenager and not to do normal teenager stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different way of growing up as a preacher's kid all the way through childhood and being a teenager. But um, also moving, because I, I went to, what, eight schools in three states over the 12 years I was in school. Okay, wow. So wow. I was always a new kid somewhere, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't have any mm -hmm. older brother. I have a sister that's four years younger than me and mm -hmm. a brother that's eight years younger than me. So I was mm -hmm. the 
the oldest, and so I was pretty much a self-contained person. Okay. You know, I'm a Scorpio, where Scorpio people tend to be like just fearless anyway. Kind oh, really? Of, you know okay. what I mean? Oh, yeah. Oh, Scorpio yeah. people have, tend to have a fearless sort of spirit about them. So I didn't have a posse. I didn't have a crew. I, it was just me. You. If I had to right. fight somebody, I was going right. to fight them. Right. You know, and when I was in Philly, there was these two boys that were crossing guards. I was in fourth grade and they were in sixth grade but they seemed like men to us well, sure. one of them was named victor and they would always mess with us little kids when we were crossing the street from school and one day there was snow on the ground and they said something to me that just pissed me off and i had, had it with them and i walked about a half block down grabbed me a piece of ice mm -hmm. and I yelled victor and we turned around <laughs> boom boom and then i ran right of course and i ran for blocks right and they caught me when i was Inside of my house. <laughs> right, right. And got I had to that. take a little bit of an ass from right, them, but right, right. they didn't mess with me anymore after that. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, what, what, so, so, were you a good student? You know, you know, relatively yeah, good student. Yeah, I, um, I was into writing. When we moved to Cincinnati, I had a sixth grade teacher named Mr. Hooks, and we had just moved there, and they had a little thing about write why you want your parents to attend PTA. So okay. I wrote it. I'd only been in the school for like a couple of months, and my little poem won. Oh, wow. And at okay. that point, I said, hmm. You know, I started thinking about writing, mm -hmm. and I was into reading books voraciously. I, I could read two or three books mm -hmm. a week when I was in sixth grade, you know. Kind of like Cat Williams. Yeah, just yeah, read 8, books. Just read. Yeah, read. You yeah, heard it <laughs> 3,000 books, right? But um, I, I read, and when I got to high school and got ready to go to college, I had – two things I loved, writing, and I kind of wanted to be an FBI agent. Well, okay. So I wrote to the FBI, and this right. is like 1973 or four. Okay. And I get a letter back, hand signed by J. Edgar Hoover. I said, thank you for your interest in the FBI. You have to have a college degree to join the bureau. Right. But once you get your degree, contact us back. So I was like, okay. Well, I'm going to go to school and major in my other thing I'm interested in, which is writing. So okay. I went to Virginia Union, majored in print journalism, and uh, I was there for three years, and I could never get a job at any of the newspapers in Richmond in the summer because they were all so, they were all so segregated back then in the mm -hmm. 70s, you yeah, know? Virginia, so yeah. at the end of my junior year, I said, you know what, I'm switching over to broadcast and transferring to Norfolk State. They have a television media department, mass comm mm -hmm. department. Went there, best move I ever made. Nice. Best nice, move. Nice, um, nice. One of my professors, Dr. Tickton, my first semester there got me a paid internship at the ABC affiliate in Norfolk, WBEC Channel 13. Okay. And so I stayed there the last year and a half I was in college. I actually had a paying job in a newsroom. Nice. So I graduated nice. with experience in the newsroom as a news writer and going out in the field with crews and shooting things. And um, then I came straight to D.C. as soon as I graduated. That's what I was going to get to because uh, you became uh, part of like the, what would you call it? You were Part of the White House correspondent? White House Press Corps. Press Corps. Yeah. Um, by 81, I had taught my way into the Bureau of Independent Network News in the National Press Building. They they hired me as the courier initially just to run tapes from the crews right. on the Hill and at the White House right. and the State Department back to the Bureau. And while I'd be hanging out in the field with the crews waiting maybe for a pro photo op to end or a hearing to end on the Hill, I would learn things from them. I learned how to do sound. And so after six months... I learned enough to become a sound man. Oh, okay. And then I'm working with a cameraman, so over the next year, year and a half, I learned how to shoot. So I really started out in the technical side, even though I graduated with a year and a half of newsroom writing experience. Right, so is that, and that's what I asked you that, if you want to be a writer, uh, I know it sounds like a stupid question, but why'd you do all the other things? Just to make yourself stronger or like that? Why did you get in? The thing is, get in when you can, how okay. you can. I and I right. tell young people this, yeah. um, you know, we don't have the nepotism in the TV and film business that exists, you know. So I literally went to the National Press Building one day with my one suit and my little resume from Norfolk State and Channel 13, and I started on the top floor knocking on every single b news bureau door from Paris, Russia, different com I'm, I'm Tom Morris. Uh, here's, uh, here's my resume. I want to work in, you know, print, uh, print TV, it, radio. Right, it right. didn't matter. right. By the time I got to the sixth floor, when I walked into INN's bureau, they had just fired the courier. Okay. And she said, I don't need anybody on the news desk right there in the assignment room, but I need a courier. Fine. I'm in. To get the foot in. To get I'm the in. Foot in. And, and then I brought in my college roommate, 
who had left Virginia Union one credit hour short of graduating, Ooh. was back wow. home living with his mom in the Northeast, called my man up, and I said, hey, Jocko, man, you want a job in television? Because when I got promoted to sound man, they said, you know, anybody might want to be the courier. I said, yeah, I'll call Jocko. To the, Jocko was just honored a few weeks ago with the Lifetime Achievement Award for really? the National Press Corps. That's dope. And he's the live camera, as we speak right now, in the Russell Rotunda at the Senate and has known every single president since Ronald Reagan. Wow. Obama used to bump cigarettes off him. Really? When, when he was on the I campaign. Now, hold on. Right. What was it about when, because I remember this, mm -hmm. when Reagan got shot, you was working I was in? the courier then. I was the courier then, and I was on my way up to the Marriott up on Connecticut Avenue yeah. to get the tapes from the event Reagan had just spoken at when the shooting happened. And I get Paige, because we had Pages right, right, back right, then. Sure. I get Paige. I stop about three blocks because the Secret Service has already cordoned off the area around the hotel where the shooting has just occurred. And uh, I run to the payphone call, and they tell me what's happened. And uh, I'm like, wow. But here's the interesting thing people don't know about that. Mm -hmm. The footage you've seen of Reagan being shot that day, mm -hmm. Hinckley came up behind the press, the cameramen that were all, the soundmen that were all here, okay. right, and the reporters. Reagan's walking across. Hinckley comes up behind them and starts shooting right through the press corps that's filming it. Because they're shooting from his, from his right, his left. Yes. Because he's walking out to his car. He's walking, and he's it, walking this right. way to the car. Right. Hinckley comes up behind the press corps uh -huh. and starts firing at Reagan. Everybody ducked. Right. Except one brother named Hank Brown. Hank had been in uh -huh. Vietnam. Hank didn't flinch. He's the one who shot the footage that we've all seen of Reagan being shot. Oh. And matter of fact, I was told he got a $20,000 bonus from ABC for shooting it. I know that's right. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Mm -hmm. Damn. Damn, 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 damn. Okay, okay. Well, that's that's kind of cool. Then, because you got a lot of we go. he got yeah. a lot. Trust yeah. me. Um, then, you, then, you went to, then you joined sometime, you know, moved over to the anti-terrorism thing. Yeah, I got out of uh, TV. I was getting divorced. I got divorced in like 86 from my first wife, and mm -hmm. I had always wanted to travel overseas, mm -hmm. just have adventure and romance and, you know, yeah, yeah, be, you know, I, I've done I mean, it. you know, just, yeah. just do it, right? And uh, so I'm looking at the Washington Post one day, I see an ad that says, Embassy Task Group Overseas Security. I'm like, overseas, that's the word. I don't care anything right. about it. I don't know what Embassy Task Group is, but right, right, right. if it's overseas right. and believe. I can get in there, right. I'm going. So I went over to Roslyn, Virginia to a skyscraper where they had this contract and they basically were training people coming out of the military and former police officers, retired police, and teaching them and training them in how to prevent embassies and consulates from being bugged during the construction phases because they had found out that the one in Russia had been built by Russian contractors who bugged the whole building when they were Rebar, right. floor panels, everything right, was right, bugged. Right, right. So wow. this wow. all this all came right. under the Omnibus Anti-Terrorism Act of '86, and so I went in there and get the first guy to interview me. He says, "Well, you've been in television, the House press corps. You you never been in the military, the police." I said, "No." I said, "But you're going to train us all to do this job, right?" Once he told me what it entailed, I said, he said, "Yeah." So I went through four interviews with four different people, and finally, I just kept saying the same thing to all of them. What difference does it make what I haven't done? You're going to train us to do this. Right, to do, to do it. To yeah, do it. I mean, there were guys coming right. in from that just got out of the Green Berets that went in in the first wave in the 60s of Green right. Berets. Now they're coming out in the right. 80s after right. 30 years. And these dudes just come back, some of them from training the Mujahideen and Bin Laden and them in Afghanistan fighting the Russians. So right, sure. It was a wild, it was a wild group of people. But, but let me ask you, um, mm -hmm. so we didn't have an anti-terrorism uh, thing before then? That particular thing didn't exist until the 86 on the Turk. Uh, Omni terrorism bill, and that's when they trained teams of people. I was part of an eight man team that got sent to Mogadishu, Somalia, which I had to look in the encyclopedia at that point to even Finally, figure out right, where that right, was. Right. Got there, and two months after I got there in the spring of '88, the civil war broke out. Right. And I stayed there for the whole year. Um, I secretly fell in love with a beautiful Somali girl. Can't blame you. Married her and smuggled her out of the country. Really? Yes. Didn't renew my contract because I was getting out of there. I said, "This is this country's about to turn over bad." That's what because I was auditioning for a movie called Black Black Hawk Down. Uh huh. And didn't that happen around a little after you got out? Black Hawk Down happened a couple about three years after I left. After you left, yeah. right? Uh -huh. But you saw the writing on the. Uh, I saw on the, the wall. things. I saw that the country was about to collapse anyway, so I didn't renew my contract. And and, and what is that? Is it some warlords just took over? And is that, why why did that go? The there? Somalia has 
14 clans or tribes. Oh, okay. The one that had been controlling everything for several decades with the backing of first the Russians and then Idi Amin, the famous mm -hmm. Idi Amin, yeah, yeah, yeah. was Uganda, Muhammad yeah. Siyar Barry's friend. And he told him one day, man, kick them Russians out. They don't have any money. The Americans have money. So he kicked the Russians out, gave them 72 hours to get out of the country, and then declared it the Democratic Republic of Somalia. Right, and right. Money started pouring in from, he, from the United States and USAID and arms and all this. And him and his tribe, it was only like 5,000 of them. They stole everything. Damn. So the other 14 tribes, the other 13 tribes was pissed. Right. They being held down. They're in the second poorest country in the world behind Bangladesh at that point in 1988. And um, they just... They just finally rose up against him, and they toppled him. But once they did, everybody started fighting everybody and ruined the whole country. Right, right, right. Yeah, because because he did the same thing with I think the English in, in uh, Idi Amin. Mm -hmm. he, he ran everybody out, out the yep. country. Yep. And, uh, and then yeah. declared him, you know, the leader. It's democracy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's what that's what that's what they want to call it. But it's all mm -hmm. yeah, it's all good. Um, okay. Now here's something that most people know you from. Then from there, you get out of that and. Let's, let's let's move forward to. Mm -hmm. I know you did I America's think, most wanted. America's most wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how does a because that was John Walsh's show. Yes. And mm -hmm. about because his son had got killed. Dylan Walsh, I guess. They got uh, Adam. Kid, Adam. Adam. I'm sorry. Adam mm -hmm. Walsh got mm -hmm. kidnapped um, and from a mall mm -hmm. um, from and beheaded. Thinking, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And killed. Right. Mm -hmm. And so he became a uh, what do you call a spokesman for child victim advocate. Right. Yeah. And he got mm -hmm. the job. Yeah. Well, yeah, he did. Uh, and he didn't create the show. He um, right. was a luxury hotel developer in Florida. And um, when that happened to him, that's when he and Ravey's right. wife started, you know, going up on the hill fighting for tougher laws right. for child Shall predators be. and so forth. And the two guys that started America's Most Wanted actually saw a show in England. Because, yeah, I remember Fox Network was just starting around 86, 87. 86, right. So you right. had Married with Children, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Simpsons, mm -hmm. and they were, these two uh, producers, David Chow and Michael Linder, saw this show in England called Crime Watch UK, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, we got way worse criminals in America <laughs> right, than they right, got right, over right, there. Right, right, right. Let's do the same thing, and let's call it America's Most Wanted. Man, who can we get to host it? And then somebody said, what about that John Walsh guy? He's a good-looking guy. He's mm -hmm. articulate. He's mm -hmm. passionate. So they asked him if he'd do it. He said, I'll try it. it, it that wasn't his thing. But the first episode only aired in eight cities. And there was a guy who had escaped from death row in Indiana named David James Roberts. Really sharp brother, smart, brilliant. But he had, like, left a baby on the side of the road to freeze to death after mm. he murdered her mother. Mm. Okay? okay? And this dude escaped from death row, mm -hmm. which is really hard to do. So the first episode of AMW airs in February 88. John Walsh is on there, and he's, you can tell he's never done this before. Right, sure. And somebody in New York City said, that guy works for the mayor's office. Yeah. David James Roberts, the death row escape right. killer, was working, working for the New York City government. Wow, wow. Well, I can imagine so many crazy stories. Let me tell you a story. Mm -hmm. um, they were doing something in D.C. D.C. was wild in the 80s, like oh, late 88 yes. and all that. And oh, they were yeah. doing a lot of shows about mm -hmm. crack dealers and shooters mm -hmm. and murders. One of my friends was an actor, in a re re you know, reenactment of that thing. AMW? Yeah, mm -hmm. of, of that. And he kind of, um, but the guy was on, they were looking for him. You know, My friend played an act, it was an actor. Mm -hmm. He was in a grocery store. And they called his ad. The police might call the police on him, thinking he was the real dude. <laughs> he played the actor. I know man. that incident very well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, man, good lord. But, but, um, okay. So, how many years had it been before they came and contacted you? How many years? Had I was. Um, I came back from Somalia in '89, and since I had gone off into working in security with a top sure. secret clearance, mm -hmm. I went to the Department of Energy and became an armed nuclear security officer at DOE headquarters in mm -hmm. Southwest. I did that for a couple of years and. Randomly one day, a friend of mine who's a golf photographer that lives in Bethesda, Maryland, my wife and I were over at his house, and she's in the landscape and remarked about the neighbor's yard across the street. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, that guy, he's executive producer of America's Most Wanted. I said, really, Chris? And he said, yeah. I said, you know, my background and degree is in television. I said, you know him? He said, he said I'm having breakfast with him tomorrow. I had my resume in the car, gave it to Chris. Three weeks later, I get a call. Coming to America's Most Wanted, which was in the Channel 5 building in Friendship Heights at the time. Okay. They give me a murder case, a double homicide case in East New York, Brooklyn. A guy named Irving Razor Jones who killed his wife and brother-in-law. And I have not done this ever. I have not right. produced a segment. I've been behind the camera. I've been out of TV for mm -hmm. six or seven years mm -hmm. total at that point. But I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. <laughs> they not gave right, me some shit. case files as examples 
of how they do a case file, go research, fly out, interview the detectives, the families, you know, the victims, come back, write a case file, then they give it to the reenactment department. Right. They turn it into a film script for the reenactment. Then we put it on, and hopefully somebody calls 1-800-CRIME-TV, and we catch the bad guy. In my case, my first case, we caught Irving Razor Jones right off the first airing. Wow. And then they gave nice. me more cases and more cases. And after about six months, they said, we're going to make you a full-time producer on the show. And so I became a full-time segment producer. And I did that for the next three years until one day the executive producer, Lance Heflin, the guy who lived across the street from my right. friend in Bethesda, Lance looked at me one day and said, you know, I think you'd be good in front of the camera. I said, really? Now I'm 40 years old at this right, point. Right. I have not been in front of the camera. Sure. All right? But I'm like, Okay. So there was a murder case that happened in Greenbelt, Maryland. A girl named Anne Marie Odlum was murdered. They had a good image of her killer at an ATM machine using her debit card after she was killed. And that's the first case I did on air wow. in my life. And I did my first stand-up walk. And this is where the suspect was seen on the right, ATM right. machine. And uh, just went from there. And, uh, I, and You know, I, I love that story because people don't realize – you never know where your blessings or your next move is going to be. And that's unfortunate. Sometimes people work their ass off to get in front of a mm -hmm. camera or do mm -hmm. something and never And, and never I happens. never did. Right. And you, you just stumbled up on it because you knew a ne next door neighbor. Yeah. And the only advice and I... That's a nice, nice area too, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. My, the only <laughs> training I got was when Lance promoted me to correspondent, he said, I'm going to get you a voice coach. And I went to the voice coach for two sessions. She said, I, you're fine. You're going to be fine. But see, when you grow up a preacher's son, you're used to speaking to people and being in front of people. And, you know, you come sure. from a, a family, generations of order. So it, it just really came natural to me to talk to people. Sure, sure. Well, we had talked, and you told me some, um, some show about some shows. Mm -hmm. that some, some cases. Yeah, cases that mm -hmm. I, I don't want to believe, but I, I'm going to believe. Because mm -hmm. I know I believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm oh, like, it's true. people are off the chain. Let's talk, talk about a couple of them. Let's mm -hmm. talk about... This amputee sex ring. Now, for those so, of them, we talking about cutting body parts off, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. Yeah. Really amputating. So we get this case um, <laughs> where a guy went to Tijuana to rendezvous with a surgeon from Chicago who was known in this underground fetish subculture of people that want to have appendages and limbs amputated so they can be sexy. And there are people that want to have sex with amputees. That is their thing. Now, I'd never heard of this. Nobody in the newsroom at AMW had ever heard of this. Why? I literally called a behavioral psychologist in D.C. just to ask, okay, this is what I'm dealing with here. I have to try to tell this story about the surgeon because here's what happened. The guy goes to Tijuana, gets his leg cut off, one leg from the knee down. He brought a friend with him who was also in this subculture to stay with him while he recovered in some seedy motel in Tijuana. Mm -hmm. Guy gets gangrene and dies. Damn. Mexican police come, want to know, why is this dude <laughs> with a fresh amputated leg in this motel room dead? Friend doesn't want to be locked up in Mexico, so he spills the whole beans. Right. Surgeon gets indicted, but he's got a ton of money because he's a rich surgeon. And right. he was charging people like 15000 to meet him in Tijuana to cut off their leg or whatever, right? Wow. So uh, he takes off, and that's how he ends up a fugitive on America's Most Wanted. And that's how I discovered that there are people out there that actually will have an arm or leg or a hand cut off to be sexy. That's crazy, right? Well, I'm not... I, you, you, well, we, well, well, I wouldn't want that, but I, I'm going to tell you something. I, on nowadays, I've been online and I've seen some fine women with like you know arm missing or something. You're like wow, yeah. you know, but at you least know. they it, they it are people who accidents or war happen. Right, to I get them. that part. These right. are people like you and I. Right, they right. got all their appendages, all right. their fingers and toes, you know, and that's what they want to do. And we caught the guy. We caught the surgeon. Oh, oh, you finally oh, yeah. did. Yeah, they caught him. Yeah, yeah. But everybody and when the show came on, people people were calling in like what. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, 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 huh? yeah. But but this is just uh, you know, there's people who want to have what's it called bestiality, necrophiliac, having sex with dead yeah, bodies. Yeah, I'm just like people. It, it's I feel like God should give everybody free will. You gotta pull some of that back, bro. Come yeah, on, God, God, pull yeah. Some of that back. And there, there were <laughs> others that took me deep into weird subcultures. There was. Um, but what about the what about the sixty year old? Multimillionaire crackhead yeah. cross dresser. That's how you Mr. making that up. This is a movie. John, this is a movie you making. You wrote a movie, ain't you? John Leone. 
Uh, this guy was an older white guy who lived in Palmer Heights, Ohio, rich suburb of Cleveland, in a mansion. Had a chauffeur, had a butler, had a young butler named Orlando. Who this brother was really funny. But uh, okay. so John Leone sold his trucking company for millions of dollars when he was in his early sixties, and he was gay. But he got into this ring of other gay guys that were smoking crack. But he had so much money, he was buying baseball sized. Crap, wow. Right? He he spent four hundred thousand mm-hmm. with one dealer. Okay. Ooh-wee. Imagine if you selling yeah. crack, you got one customer, you can make four hundred thousand a year off. So yeah. here's what he was doing. He's bringing, he's having his chauffeur go into East Cleveland, pick up crackheads, bring them out to the mansion, take them upstairs into the master bedroom, which is his sex boudoir. And he has a security door that once they're in there, he locks them in. Damn. Tell he's ready to let them go leave. So the thing he was into was, in addition to cross-dressing and having all kinds of crack fuel sex, was, as the detective had to explain it on the show, sexual gratification through the consumption of human waste. Ooh. And, uh, yeah, uh, when I first talked to the detective the very first time about this case and he started telling me, so here's why it again, here's why they only ended up on AMW. One night... They bring out a new crackhead from the, from the hood. Okay. He is up in the room with them. Mm-hmm. They smoking the crack. He's All got right. one of his regulars there. Okay. They got a big golf ball size, you know, mm-hmm. crack, b- softball uh, size uh, thing. Right. They got razors that they're slicing the crack off with. And he had a swing hanging over his bed. So these guys, once they got high, he would say, okay, I want you to. He said, my man's going to show you what I want you to do. So he's going to get up in the swing. And I'm going to lay under him, and he's going to defecate and blah, da da right? So this new crackhead is like, he's sitting there like, this crazy. <laughs> like, uh, I'm high. Right. Why ain't that high? Right, 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 <laughs> I want to go back right. to Cleveland, right? right he's right, like, right. take me back to Cleveland now. Right, right. Some Let bullshit. me out of here, right? right, right. So <laughs> they won't let him out. So it's on the second floor of this Tudor mansion. He starts busting the glass out to jump out the window. sure. sure. Leone and the other dude grab the crack razors and start slashing this dude. And he's buck naked. Ooh. He's high on crack. Right. It's dead of winter. There's snow on the ground. It's Ohio. It's Cleveland. Right. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. He dives out the window, bleeding, runs through this neighborhood to a, the next mansion, which is like some rich people, right. some other rich people. Right. And they look out the window. It's like three in the morning. There's a naked, blood drenched black man right, in right. the yard. Right. And so they call the police. They follow the blood trail back to Leone's mansion. And they charge him with attempted murder. Wow. And that's how I end up. And he takes off. And he leaves the country. But we caught him in uh, Playa del Carmen, Mexico. Boy. There's some dudes like that right now yeah. around, around this world doing some crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. The lesbians who stoned the dwarf. Ah. What, what, these are, these are, these are this like. Was, this one. Uh, so there was a guy in uh, Oregon named Donald Fish. He was a little person. Mm-hmm. And he was the portrait photographer at Sears. And he had learned how to shoot pool, despite his diminutive stature, by holding the pool cue over his head. Wow, okay. So one night he's in a bar. He's playing pool. He's taking people's money. And these two kind of trailer park type girls, uh, one of them named uh, Tracy Poirier, she, uh, they see him winning all this money. Mm-hmm. So they sidle up to him at the bar when he takes a break and convince him it's his lucky night. He's going to have a menage a trois. And he had his own car with the controls where he could drive with his hands and everything. So they leave the bar. They go get a 12-pack of Bush beer, the beer of champions. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then they drive down to the riverbank where they're going to, he thinks they're going to have this menage a trois. But when they get there, they beat him up, overpower him, and uh, throw him in the trunk of, his, of the, his car for a little while. And then they get him out the trunk and beat him to death with rocks. And leave him laying there on the riverbank where a family coming coming along the next morning on a family outing finds this bludgeon dwarf laying there. Wow. So long story short, they get convicted. Tracy Poirier gets sent to prison and she seduces a guard named Pam Trimble. And Pam Trimble gets fired for fraternizing with the inmate. Right. And then she breaks into the prison and busts out Tracy. That's wow. how the case ends up on America's Most Wanted. It's not because he killed him. It's not because they had already the dwarf murder was the front end of this whole case. And when I started investigating 
profiling these two fugitive women now, the detective said, you need to get, I'm going to send you the headline from the murder. And the headline was, Lesbian Stone Dwarf to Death. And everybody, when I got it in the right. mail, I opened it up, and I showed it to the people in the news. Everybody was like, that's got to be like the best headline we've right, ever right, seen. Right, and right, I, right. It's I bad, it. but it's it's just eye-catching. Well, doing, them, doing that show and, and looking for one of the people, did people ever come after you? Yes. Like one, mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. like one oh, yeah. of you, like, oh yeah, you know, mm-hmm. I'm thinking you yeah. exposing them. Yeah, John Walsh had armed bodyguards. Uh, I did not. Um, but fortunately, I was highly trained at that point in my anti-terrorism yeah, right, right, skills right. and so forth. And uh, I got threatened by the son of the Mongols outlaw biker gang when I was on a raid with the uh, ATF taking down that whole group doing a big uh, RICO thing. And uh, he, th- he literally threatened me on camera. And uh, so I, that was uh, he actually helped me out, though, because I was able to get a concealed carry permit because of him. Oh, because of him? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, wowsy, wowsy. Yeah. Um, Wow, that's 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 that's. What, what, did, did you did you did you have a little fear while you were working there? Sometimes just going home. And just I mean, I've around? been to some scary places okay. that I had to go to tell to shoot stories. I remember going to Nickerson Gardens. Oh yeah, in L.A. In L.A. And there was a murder case I did out there. This is back in the early mid nineties, and yeah, that hot. place was you know Nickerson yeah, Gardens. Yeah, of course, I, uh, I, man, I rolled through with a cop one time. I was that's right I did shit. too, and all the street lights were shot out. It was pitch black out there. You just uh-huh. see shadows of people that were selling drugs mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. gang bangers. But I've been to a lot of really scary places. Baltimore, I had oh. a close call in Baltimore once, and um, but yeah, but you know, you just you you dare to do your job and to tell the story and try to get justice for the victims who've been wrong. You know, and, and but, but when you when you go to Nicholson Guard, so you say you had police escort, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, because it's funny. I, I did a ride share with a friend. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, he uh. I remember we had acting class together, but he was a policeman, mm-hmm. and a sheriff, and um, and so we go to the sheriff, and he and he gives me a, uh, I had to sign a form out. Mm-hmm. I had sweatpants on, a sweatshirt, and mm-hmm. I'm gonna hang my boy, you know, mm-hmm. see cool stuff. Mm-hmm. We get to go, we go out, we get to his car. He pops the trunk, and he hands me a um, bulletproof vest. I'm thinking, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not thinking it's that serious until it gets serious. Then he hands me a gun. Now the problem was I had sweatpants on, mm. so you know, gun is heavy, so it's gonna hang and pull the shit down. I don't think he was supposed to do that, but <laughs> uh, no, 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 right, right. He, probably, well, he said, "Man, if you gotta use it, you, you gotta, gotta use it." it. Okay. I said, "What? We'll, we'll deal with I the consequences." Yeah, I wasn't yeah. expecting to do that. So we're riding through the, we're through Nicholson Garden, mm-hmm. and it's at nighttime. We're talking about like twelve thirty, and dudes are all on the um on the hoods of the cars mm-hmm. just sitting around. And I'm with the police, man, and I, I'm nervous. I can't even. Remember. I was like, "Oh, yeah. holy shit!" And yeah. I remember, he, I remember he kept riding around and would put the light on people. Like guys mm-hmm. walking on the street, say, hey, pull, he pull him over. And one time he pulled these two dudes over, older guys. They might be in their f- late 40s or whatever. And one guy had a hand in his jacket. And he said, come here, y'all. Now, I'm in the passenger side. And he's like, uh, put your hand on the hood. Mm-hmm. So one dude put his hand on the hood. The other one put one hand, kept one hand in his pocket. Mm-hmm. And he kept saying, hey, take, your, take your hand out of the other pocket. Put it on the hood. Mm-hmm. He was like, he said, man, I'm going to ask you again. But at the point, I thought, because my thing is, we you, know, you do what the cops say. This is just where I grew up at. You know what I'm saying? All that bucking the cops was. Mm-hmm. So I said, "Oh my God, he got a gun in his hand. He got to have a gun." You know, the guys that take the, the hand out, you won't take the hand out. So I got the car. I opened the door. I got the car. So I, re- I reached for the gun. Mm-hmm. And he still talking to me. I said, "I got, I got to shoot this man. I'm about to kill this dude, man. I'm nervous <laughs> as hell." Like, oh my God! And he finally put it out. And what he had was a. Um, what they were doing was they were breaking up antennas at the time because mm-hmm. they were smoking crack. So you break the antenna, you cut it off. And then you get like a top of a, a bottle, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. bottle, you make that. And they had like mm-hmm. a, 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 what do you call it, a little mesh. A mesh. Me- right, oh, like yeah, steel, wire mesh. Mesh. steel mesh. Right, wire mesh. Steel right, wool. Steel right, right, that's all you mm-hmm. had. I was like, dude, you, you almost got killed for that, dude. Mm-hmm. You got your yeah. damn mind. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, I was, yeah, yeah. So I was fearful with just him. I, I mean, to go in those places, I can't even imagine, man. In the Baltimore situation, Baltimore's rough. Yeah, it is, man. Uh, the, but the most dangerous place I ever went, was Kingston, Jamaica. I can see that. See, people don't go to Tillable Kingston Gar- for vacation. Tivoli Gardens? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Tivoli Gardens Tivoli is like, down yeah, there. Yeah. Um, we had to actually go to Spanish Town Ooh. to a place called Lieber Gardens. And uh, I was with the Jamaican Constabulary Force. There was this guy named Dudley Forbes who was Jamaican, moved to Toronto, was abusive to his woman, stabbed her, tried to kill her. She survived. Long story short, she's out in the nightclub. She thinks it's all behind her now. He's walking by, sees her in the West Indian nightclub, and just shoots the whole Ooh. whole club up. Mm-hmm. Shoots a whole bunch of people, kills people that had nothing to do with it, didn't kill her. 
And so we kept profiling this guy on AMW for years. I think it must have gone on. We must have profiled Dudley Forbes for 10 straight years. Really? Yeah, he was really good at, at high, being a fugitive. And so he finally got caught after another airing down in, in Spanish Town, which is not too far from Kingston. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so me and one of the Jamaican constabulary uh, officers, they're like the U.S. Marshals okay. of Jamaica. Okay. So these guys, this is how bad it is. When they get in the car... They take their pistol out of the holster and set it on their lap I know that's right. for the entire time while they drive around wherever they're going. They just ready for a shootout all the time, every minute, right? So we get out there. We get to this. There's a lot of poverty on the road to mm -hmm. Spanish Town. Mm -hmm. Then you get to Spanish Town. We get to this subdivision. It's nice. So we got to shoot some B-roll. This is the house where Dudley Forbes was captured after a 10-year manhunt, blah, blah, blah. And I'm with my cameraman He's over there, Andy and the soundman, they're filming the house. Mm -hmm. And me and the officer are talking to one of the neighbors who was home when they raided the house and arrested him. So she's telling us about that night. When, and this car goes by real slow. Two mm -hmm. dudes in it look at us. I didn't really think anything of it. A few minutes later, they come back, they stop, and they go into the house next to the one we're filming. Now, I still have to do my stand-up, you know, about this is right, where Dudley sure. Forbes was captured. Mm -hmm. But... Next thing we see, these two dudes come walking across the street. One of them's got a gun right here visible. And I look at, I say, yo, to the officer, I say, yo, man, this is a dude coming with a gun. Right. My man, my officer, he reaches under the seat. His car comes out with an Uzi and runs up to this dude. Who the hell are you, man? <laughs> right, sure, sure. And I'm just like, whoa, it's getting real. Right, right, now. right, sure. So they, wow. they leave. He says, look, whatever you're going to do, do it quick. Quickly. Because yeah. the next thing we're going to see, he said that house where Forbes was, was owned by the Don of Spanish Town. Mm -hmm. The gang, the Godfather's. Right, 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 sure. Bulby. He said, the next thing we're going to see is two carloads of shooters. And it's just one of me with y'all with my guns. So shoot your stand up and let's get out of here. And that's what I wow, did. Wow, wow, wow. That's, that's, wow. that's crazy. But let's let's move on to something else. Because mm -hmm. um, you got so much going with yourself, man. Something We could be here forever. Um, then you went to Live PD. Mm -hmm. Right now, but not directly. Okay, did you did you get fired from uh, no uh, from AMW? Yeah, no. AMW ran for twenty five years, right? And it finally went off the air for good in twenty twelve. Okay, and I'd been there at that point twenty years. Uh, now I was suddenly supposed to become a freelancer, and you know AMW was headquartered here in the DMV all those twenty five years. So we that. weren't mm -hmm. in New York or L A, and uh, there weren't that many. It was either, am I going to go do local news? I didn't want to do that. Or am I going to sell my house and move my family to another to New York or something? No, I wasn't going to do that either at okay. that point. So I said, you know, I got to do something. And I've been working with police departments for 20 years. And I said, you know what? This freelance thing, the phone would ring every now and then. I got a call to be on a couple of episodes of Deadline Crime with Tamron Hall the first season. I did a couple of murder cases on there mm -hmm. but it just wasn't steady money i mean you know how entertainment can sure. go man it can be you can be steady and then all of a sudden you <coughs> dried up <coughs> phone's not ringing right, right. and you start wondering if you ever were in the yeah. game you know damn that's true okay real. all that's right real with it. Mm -hmm. so i said well you know what i'm gonna become a, a mpd a dc cop what the? no age cut off until you up to 67 and this time i'm 56 right so i'm like I go to orientation at the police academy in Southeast. Okay. And the only thing that stopped me from doing it was I would have had to be there at 5 in the morning for six straight months driving from Maryland all the way to I was right. like, I can't do that. Right, right. I stay up Not too late. I stay up too late to get up at 5 o'clock. Right, I heard okay? that. Okay? <laughs> so, so what's the next best thing? Shorter route, become a special police officer in D.C. Get trained by Capital Cities Protective. Spring of 2013, I become a foot patrol special police officer in a part of the city called Sersum Quarter. Sir, that's the hood. Tyler House. That's the hood, Sersum Quarter. I know Florida that. Florida and North Capitol. On the night shift, foot patrol. Okay? So, and I'm still popping up on TV on like that line crime and stuff, right? Right, right, so, right, 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 right. The first night, I'm, the first night I'm, I'm on foot patrol, this, there was this white boy named Abner. He was the officer that took me around to show me the beat and this is where they do dice games we break up over here and this is where they sell crack over there and, and he was that white dude from Detroit that was in Four Brothers the real one 
Oh, okay. Okay, remember that movie? Yeah, I remember the movie, yeah. Yeah, he was that dude. Grew up, white boy grew up in the hood in Detroit, right. uh -huh. was absolutely the most hood white dude I ever met. And he had just come back from Iraq where he was in a unit hunting down high value terrorists and killing them. So mm -hmm. he had killed a bunch of people. So anyway, he's taking me on my first night of foot patrol around Tyler House and Sersum Quarter and Julius hey, Hobson houses Quarter. and everything. And all of a sudden we hear this explosion, like boom. I, I mean, what's that? Happened is like, oh, it's a half stick. What? What's that? Half stick of dynamite. They throw them around here. I'm like, hold up, man. I can see the Capitol Dome. Right, You're right, telling right. me yeah. the people throw sticks of dynamite that close. <laughs> eight wow. blocks from the Capitol. Yeah. He said, yeah, man, don't worry about it. So a few weeks later, um, I'm at the corner of North Capitol in Florida, and I see a guy. There's a car sitting at the light wait, facing me waiting for the light to change. There's a liquor store next to him, and I see a guy come running down Florida Avenue with sparks flying out of his hand. Now, I don't know if you remember the movie Dirty Dozen with Jim Brown, but there's Not a really scene at the end where Jim Brown is running, dropping grenades down these tubes of this German chateau and blowing them up. Mm -hmm. And that's the first thing I thought when I see this guy running with this thing. He runs up to the city trash can that's right beside the guy in the car at the light. Right. And you know, those are wrought iron bolted to the sidewalk mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. trash cans inside it. Mm -hmm. He throws this in there and it explodes. Mm -hmm. The trash can goes flying in the air. The dude in the car jumps out and tries to chase the dude. He, he's like, he doesn't even understand what just happened, really. And I'm just like, did I really just see this? Right, I right. didn't realize until the cops came in a tow truck that this explosion was so severe, it disabled his vehicle. Oh. Eight blocks from oh, the wait, U.S. Wow. Capitol, okay? And I oh. witnessed it. So a few weeks later, this dude came over from the nightclub at Beza, mm -hmm. got drunk. I think I remember that. Huh? There was a nightclub called the Beza on the other side of North mm -hmm. Capitol that summer, and... This dude got drunk, this white dude got drunk, came over there to our side, walked up on some young black kids that were smoking weed on the corner, and apparently made the mistake of saying, I like black booty. And when I got there, he was unconscious with his eyes open, mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, okay. So the same cops come that it responded to the blow, blown up car. Well, right. So when we got this guy shipped off to Howard Hospital. I said, hey, y'all came for that uh, explosion a couple weeks ago. He said, yeah. I said, how come ATF didn't come? I said, well, they just blew, he blew up a car eight blocks from the Capitol. Nobody, Homeland Security. The hood. Yeah, he said, that's because it's over here. Right. He I'm said, they did this up on Capitol Hill. It, you know, firecracker would have been. He said, ahead. people with tinfoil helmets and yeah. spacesuits would have showed up. Right, I said, right. Oh, no, okay. no. Yeah, that's a true story. Wow. But let me, but let me ask you something, uh, because I... I've been through it. Um, mm -hmm. You go from 20 years on TV, making mm -hmm. decent money. Mm -hmm. Then the money, you know, most. Yep. And now you're a foot patrol. Yeah. How much does that bother you? Foot patrol fighting foreclosure. <laughs> okay. It's like, and and foreclosures. Like, okay. Yeah. It's like, it, it's rough. It's what, rough. What, what goes through your mind? And then, you know, because. I mean, maybe you don't you don't fall feel like it's another level down. I, I've done something. I felt a certain way. How do you just get your mental together and say, hey, man. You know, because that's you foot just, patrol, police. You know, man? it's part of it's how you're raised. You okay. know, the people you come from. Okay. What they teach you about life. What they teach you about adversity. Mm -hmm. What they teach you about having faith in yourself, having faith in God, having mm -hmm. not fearing things, and just believing Lord, you'll right. figure it out come somehow. On, you know, and I was fortunate in that one of the guys I had worked with at Department of Energy back in 1990, 91, before AMW. Mike Holson, who played for the Houston Oilers, a wide receiver. Okay, Mike uh, had become a diplomatic security uniform division officer 20 years before. And at the end of that year, as I was uh, still an SPO, he said, hey, man, I can get you a job, uniform division, State Department, Main State, down in Foggy Bottom. I went from $13 an hour as an SPO to $33 an hour as a uniform diplomatic security officer. On the night shift again. But I spent three winters, uh, winter 2013, 14, 15, 16, wow. outside right. in the guard booth in the dead of winter, foot Damn, patrol man. by myself all night. Anybody recognize you sometimes? When you yeah. Were? Oh, yeah. 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 And I was still popping up on right. different shows. Like right. there were some investigation, discovery, murder shows. I would go right. on as an expert helping to tell this story or Fatal Attraction from TV One. I helped launch the Fatal really? Attraction series. I, 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 did I produced episode. the first two episodes of Fatal Attraction for TV One. Did you? Yes. That's uh -huh. dope. I did one episode of that. Yeah. One. Yeah, yeah. I wanted yeah. to do that. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, so from there, they call, then how did you get live PD? How did they, they do it? One of the 
co-creators of Live PD was a, a girl, young lady named Kara Kurtz, who had come to mm -hmm. AMW when she was fresh out of college back in the 97. And she co-created Live PD with mm -hmm. Big Fish Entertainment. And um, I was, at that point, I had left Diplomatic Security and taken my top secret clearance over to the Department of Navy and was working as a declassification analyst in a secure room every day. Mm -hmm. And she calls me and says, hey, we got this new show in New York called Live PD and would you be interested in coming up for an audition? And I didn't know it at the time. Um, the show had already been on for six episodes when I went up on audition. So okay. I took a day off, went up there, and they uh, put me in the studio, and one of the producers played Dan Abrams, who was the host, mm -hmm. and showed mm -hmm. us some clips from the mm -hmm. episodes they'd already done, and then I chimed in with my play-by-play -play color commentary analysis of what I saw in these clips. And when I got done, they took me into the master control and it was full of all these people and they all just started clapping. And they were like, where have you been? Really? And I was like, nice. uh, working for the government and right. skip every day for $60,000 a year. That's what I'm thinking, right. right? So I come up there, I go on the show. The first week, I made a blunder. Now, keep in mind, I'm not used to doing live TV. I haven't right, done right, live right, TV, right, really. Right. I've done some hits on CNN or... Some shows talking about AMW cases I had. Sure. I've been on Nancy Grace and stuff like that. That's two or three minutes, mm -hmm. but not hours of live. So, and I don't know Dan Abrams. Right. First episode, a guy gets caught with a bunch of weed, and I say, Yeah, I say, That reminds me of that rap song by uh, Flo Rida, Riding Dirty. Mm -hmm. And a few minutes later, during the break, Dan says, uh, Viewers are tweeting that. That's not correct. That it was Chameleon there that made that song. Right, right. I'm about to say Chameleon. And, Chameleon. Right. And I'm like, that's, that's okay, Dan. I'll take that hip hop. I'll take that hip hop L. When we come back, we're going to get an opportunity in the, in the action okay. for me to thank the viewers for yeah. correcting me. This is my very first episode, right? Right, 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 right? And I'll take that L. So I did. And the viewers loved it. They were like, that's so honest. He, and, and I made the, I called them the Live PD Nation. I, nice. I said, you know, Dan, Live PD Nation, I uttered those words, which became the thing. Right, Live sure, PD Nation, mm -hmm. all these rabid fans for the next right, four years. Right, right. And um, the second week I was on, the viewers went from 600,000 to a million. What? Second week. And it was people saying, that's our man from AMW for 20 years. Where's he been for the last, right. since 2012, right, you sure. know? And uh, we just went on from there, and we became the most... Highest rated show on cable TV for the next four years. Good, good stuff. Um, I'm gonna go back and forth in in your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't realize you were a hip hop DJ. Yes. What the? What, what have still, you done, man? You do plumbing yeah, I still too? got a music plumbing? room right now. Turntable <laughs> set up, keyboards. I still go down there and chop it up. I started in the '80s when uh, King of Rock. Jam Master J and Run yeah. King of Rock. I was like, I got to do that. I got to do that. I got my first coffee right. on my turntables. Okay. Never stop. Um, in the early 90s, when WPFW in Washington had an underground show hosted by my buddy X-Man, and Friday yeah. nights we were on for three hours. So okay. this is like 93, 94, 95, the golden era of hip-hop. Hip-hop right? was dope. Yeah. And these groups were, and nobody was playing underground hip-hop. WPGC wasn't playing right. it. Right. But you had these emerging artists, Common, The Roots, De La Far side, uh, Nas, all, all of them. Nas, yeah, all yeah. of them. So I was listening to the show, reached out to X Men, and said, Hey, man, I was working at AMW at the time, full okay. time, but I said, Hey, man, I'm Tom Morris. They call me T Wright. I'm interested in being a part of your crew. So I started doing hip hop news segments on the show every Friday. Oh, night. That's, yeah. that's interesting. And yeah. I started shooting stuff in DC for a show in New York called Ghettonomics, which was kind of like Ralph Daniels. Okay, yeah. Um, um, his, um, yeah, uh, his hip hop show that was, was that? so, so yeah. legendary in all the right. boroughs and so I, that's how I met Peter Rosenberg from Hot 97 he was a student at Maryland doing his show called Dust Till Dawn on Friday nights playing underground hip hop okay. and so I went up there with my little high 8 camera and shot him in the studio doing uh his show right. and put it on in New York. So that's how I kind of circulated. And then, like, the Roots came over to my house in Langley Park and was down in the basement way back in 93. The memories, man. It was funny, too. Black Thought. He didn't know I worked for Marex was wanted at first. So that night when they were at, the, at my house, he said, uh, I was telling him I worked for AMW. And I said, yeah, I was just on last night. I had a case out in Arizona. And, and he suddenly realized, hold it. 
that, that, that I was in a hotel last night, wherever we were, right. and I watched that case about right. the woman named Bobby that was murdered. He said, that was UT, right? I'm like, yeah, that's Tom Morris Jr. Right, that's right, the other, right, that's right. the other me. Nice, yeah. nice. A around that time, who's some of the other people you, you you actually sat and talked with and got the? Oh man, I interviewed Nas. Nas right when he dropped the Omatic, he came down to wow. DC. He had on a red Adidas jogging suit. He was really quiet, and so I interviewed him in a empty studio uh -huh. room, just the two of us sat down and interviewed him about Illmatic, which has literally just come out two or three wow. weeks before. Okay. And then he comes on the show. And then after the show, we all went to a club called the Ibex up on course, George Avenue. That. Come on. And oh, about man. 75 of us that night watched Nas oh. perform Illmatic, the complete album, three weeks after it dropped. Really? And Ibex, for those in D.C., shout out to Ibex. I used to perform the uh what was it? Catfish Mayfield. Shout out to him. Yep. Uh, oh, head. Oh, head. Yeah, man. Yeah. Wow, wow. All right. Now, you've had some other interviews. Now, when did you interview, like, Tupac? What, what was what was? That, that was for a show called Dr. Nubian's Fantastic Voyage to a Planet Called Video, hosted by my buddy Steve Dr. Nubian Cobb, okay. who back in the 90s had this uh, public access show, mm -hmm. Dr. Nubian's <laughs> Fantastic voyage right. to, to a planet called Video. So Howard University used to have an annual hip hop conference back in the okay. '90s, every mm -hmm. March or so, every in the okay. spring. And this particular year, '96, I believe it was, Tupac had just started his Thug Life, you know, mantra and, Persona, right. Persona, and all right. that. Yeah, right. And uh, and so Steve and I shot an interview with him at Howard, and I remember he had on the star diamond ring. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and then he went out on the yard and he started chanting Thug Life and all the people around him jumping up and down Thug Life. And I remember looking over there and thinking, I don't know if this is good or not, but... Mm -hmm. but uh, Was but this before Death Row? Or is this, this, this Death it was 96, so... Right. He, died, he passed away in 96, so... Well, this September. must have been 94, 95, then. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Two years. So yeah, yeah, this, this might have been 95. Cause I think when he yeah had, yeah he did mm -hmm. a couple so I get around I think I mean yeah. he had a thug life yeah. on, yeah. on his stomach for that yeah. Um, yeah now 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 when you met him was he, did you already know who he was yes absolutely yeah you knew who yeah. he was oh yeah absolutely yeah. what what about him do you think why do you, what do you think was it about him why do you think that people gravitated towards him brilliant charismatic unique looking um, not tall not sure not man. tall but um, he just had charisma. Mm -hmm. And it just jumped out at you. Um, and he was he was just so lucid, and mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Just he was just you could tell there was something special about him. I didn't necessarily understand the whole thug life thing at the time. Sure. And uh, ironically, I did a lot of cases with Vegas Homicide over my years with AMW because it was always an interesting murder case in they Vegas. needed help with in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And uh, the detectives that worked on his murder, one of Michael Franks, Detective Michael Franks. I actually was able to actually, you know, get some inside information and see mm -hmm. some things that most people will never see regarding that case. But really? I, I can confirm to you and all of your viewers, Pierre, Tupac is dead. Well, that means you must have seen something that we ain't. He is dead. I saw him alive, and I can tell you he is dead. Oh, I saw him alive. I can say, okay, okay. So, I saw so, him alive. Right. And I can tell you he's dead. dead. Yeah, right, right. No. And, and um, things weren't doctored up. No. no. Okay. No. Okay. 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 You trust your source. The only time he's been alive was a hologram at Coachella. Right. 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 <laughs> That's about that. But 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 yeah, I, I met him. I think it's also mm -hmm. he like he had an engaging smile. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I did a video with him called um um it was. Um, you did a video with Tupac? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, um, it's all go every little city we go. Every yep. little video, yep, yep, yep. we see that thing. I think it looked, yeah. I forgot the name of the song. Yeah. People would kill me in the comments. You did the name of the song, you know. <laughs> but um, he picked me out of, uh, he said mm -hmm. he saw me while he was in jail. Mm -hmm. And he uh, was like, when I get out, I want to work with you. And Chris Tucker, he did mm -hmm. California Love with Chris Tucker right mm -hmm. before me. Mm -hmm. Did that. One thing I did notice was he came into my trailer on the set. And um, it's, it's weird. Every time I would come around, him and Gaddafi and all them uh, from the Outlaws, Always wanted me to make them laugh. They were like, say something mm. funny. And anything mm. I said, they thought was funny. I'm like, man, I'm about to go to my room, man. With my trailer. <laughs> ah, he's in trailer. That boy, wow, with the trailer. I'm like, what the fuck? Hey, what time is craft service? No, you ain't say craft service. You ain't craft service. You say craft service. I'm like, what the fuck? What the shit, you know? I'm like, am I on or something? So I was in my room by myself, my trailer myself, and he um he came in, sat down, and he had wore like uh what do you call it um. Non hip hop gear. He had leather, like a leather mm -hmm. vest. He had mm -hmm. kids in the video. He had a suit I remember on. the vest, with yeah, short yeah. sleeve t shirt, yep, white yep. t shirt. Well, yeah. he, well, he didn't have this, this uh -huh. video. He just was 
the same vest, but no, mm-hmm. no shirt on mm-hmm. and on some leather. He was in a, his bandana. He was on a motorcycle in the video, mm-hmm. and he had kids in the video. And this is why he was signed with Death Row. And um, I knew something different. I, knew, I was like, "Where the Timberlands? Where, where, where that hardcore look?" And he came to my room, in my, in my trailer, mm-hmm. and he said these words. I'll never forget. That. He said, "Man, I'm I'm getting tired of this whole West Coast East Coast beef, man." Mm-hmm. I was like, "What?" And so, because you know, I'm from the East Coast, mm-hmm. and that's why I asked about the Tims, why he wasn't wearing nothing like that. And he said to me, um, he was getting tired of it. And I said, okay. And, um, you know, I think it was just, and, and, and who was pushing it really was Suge, Suge Knight, you know, that mm-hmm. situation. Mm-hmm. Because that video, he yeah. did, Suge Knight didn't even want him to have that video. Mm-hmm. You saw the more cool, friendly kids and all mm-hmm. that. Yeah, he wanted all that more gangster mm-hmm. stuff. And um, that video didn't come out for a long time after he passed away. Um, and um, I think it, maybe it was about, I don't know what year, because, so I did Tupac's first and Dr. Dre's second. Mm-hmm. And I and I remember asking for a lot of money for Dr. Dre video. I didn't mm-hmm. know if they give it to me or not. Mm-hmm. And um it was funny. I think it was I, I mean, I don't know. I think I wanted fifteen hundred dollars. It said it's a three day shoot. I said, Well, I want fifteen hundred dollars. I was saying a day, you know. A day. And I didn't know if they thought I meant fifteen hundred dollars for the three days. I was mm-hmm. saying I want fifteen hundred dollars for the three days, meaning mm-hmm. for each day. Right. And I thought they thought I thought I hope they don't think I mean five hundred dollars after I did <laughs> and hung up and everything. And so when the check came, I was like, man, I'm saying fifteen hundred dollars. It was forty five hundred. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank oh, you, yeah. Dr. Dre. Thank you. Rich. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But um yeah. but but his, his personality was something else, man. He was I, a writer. I, yeah, right. He was at, at his core, he was a prolific writer. Mm-hmm. He was like the Hemingway of hip hop. Okay. He had to write, he had to get his thoughts out, and he could articulate them, and he had a relentless work ethic. The dude could just right. stay in the sure. studio for yeah. weeks at a time, yeah. just writing, writing, writing. Not many people can do that. Right, right. And you knew all that when you first, when you saw him that day, mm-hmm. and you know, he's on the yard and yeah. bringing everybody in. You just yeah. like, I mean, oh, I knew he it was brilliant it. when Brenda's Got a Baby came out. I was just like, this is some next level right here. Right. This is this is a, telling a story of humanity that most rappers just can't do. Right, you know, right, right, right. And, and wouldn't do. Right. And many people call him the greatest rapper of all time. Um, and I have my that's my a favorite. debate we, right yeah. exactly yeah. Um, I would say if you capsulize his whole career and everything about him what he stood mm-hmm. for I would agree with that mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned but you know you know, if he's putting you know, mm-hmm. to me my favorite rapper you know, you know, get in the comments and I like Big I mean I like uh, Tupac but mm-hmm. I would say Biggie was probably mm-hmm. my favorite one mm-hmm. you know rapper mm-hmm. but Tupac was definitely you know up there you know what I'm saying for me Black Thought okay oh, that's a good one well Blaze Smoke anybody okay, that has a yeah, tongue yeah, and yeah. vocal cords. Come on now. I'm concerned. Come on now. Fonte from Little Brother. Fonte. I remember Little Brother. Yeah, I remember, yeah. Big Pooh ain't bad either, but Fonte Coleman? Right. Fonte Coleman is like a that. Beast. And has something to say. These are people that have something to say. Right, right, you right. Know, I'm not that. I'm going to do the do 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 No, they got something to say. Right. You know what I mean? I don't right. like these mumbling you know, just inarticulate, mm-hmm. you know, tell me to shoot somebody, you know. No, these guys are brilliant orators. And Black Thought, he's just, he's so mm-hmm. prolific on the Come mic, on. you just can't, you can't say he's not in the top five. Right. If you I know anything about hip-hop, right. for sure. But, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, we all have our preferences. Right, Biggie, right, obviously. Right, right, right. Um, You know, but, yeah, there's, there's so many. And yeah. there's a lot of great young rappers out here now like a lot of people my age i'm mm-hmm. 67 so mm-hmm. a lot of people my age are not listening to new Damn. music every day i'm listening to everybody from no name to terrence martin you name it i'm right. saba and you know i'm constantly looking for new artists to listen to and then making playlists and sending them to other people right. so they if they don't know they can right. find out here is it just because of your love of being a dj and love, love of music? music i've been love a musician since i was seven years old dope. i started playing piano and taking piano lessons at seven dope 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 mm-hmm. dope and now now you spoke with somebody who, who told a secret that wasn't yes. really a thing to say back in the days. Yes. When you interviewed yes. Busy Bone. Yes. Um, right after I got promoted to on-air correspondent at AMW, this was around 2000, 2001, something like that, uh-huh. um, mm-hmm. we got a new supervising producer at AMW. And so he started going through a stack of mail that had been on the previous supervising producer's desk. And he came to me one day and he had a letter. He said, you know, Tom, I got this letter here. And it's from uh, some kind of rapper. His name is uh, Busy Bone, and this is a, like a middle-aged white guy. Yeah, he has sure. no idea what, what, who yeah, this right, is. Right. And I said, let me see that. And I look at it, and I read the letter, and the letter is to John Walsh, and he's saying, Dear Mr. Walsh, you and your wife insisted on putting up pictures of missing kids at the end of the made-for-TV movie on NBC in 1983. And me and my two sisters were abducted by my mother's boyfriend from Cleveland, mm-hmm. and we were taken to Arizona 
and we were recovered because you showed our pictures at the end of the Adam wow. Walsh movie. And I want to come on AMW to tell my story and thank you. And so, and I said to Steve, the producer, I said, Steve, the, he's part of Bone Thugs and Harmony. They are multi-platinum, unique rap group. There's nobody else even like them. I said, so this is, I said, just, I'll do this story. If Lance approves it, so he's showing up. So when I went to interview him, we went out to a studio, uh, a place in Columbus, Ohio, that a guy that runs a production company out there I had shot with, he had bought this castle mm -hmm. that some white-collar criminal had built a castle with a moat around it and horse stables. Damn. And so that's where I brought Busy to do the interview because there mm -hmm. were sound studios and everything there. So he started to tell the story on camera about how he was abducted, how he was molested, mm. and all of this. And, um, and he was just so genuine, and he was so grateful to John Walsh because his life... He might have never become Busy Bone if it wasn't for his picture being shown on, in man. that movie. He might not have That's lived facts. to be grown, you know? So his gratitude was sincere and genuine, and he was the first rapper that I was aware of to come out and say I was molested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is 20-something yeah. yeah. years yeah, ago, yeah, yeah. you know? And it was all yeah. in the source. And, 2000, yeah. yeah, it was all in the source, and all the magazines picked it up, and it was just like Busy Bone has told his story. And at the end of the interview, he said, I want to do a song a tribute to John Walsh. So we were there, and I started digging through the sound library in the studio, looking for beats. He sat down, started, we got, got a, built, uh, my friend bought some beers, and we were drinking beers and sitting there, and Busy's writing it out, and then he writes this song, and I put the track on, and I can honestly say I produced the track with Busy Bone. Wow. And we aired it at the end of the piece, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful song because he's telling kids and people that have been molested and been through sure. all these things you know you can overcome this god will be there for you, it, you go on youtube it, it's awesome what's the name of the song um i'm trying to remember did it really have a name it Damn. was it was just a tribute to john walsh it was just a thank you it, i don't even think it had a name but it's on that whole piece the whole segment i did is on youtube and you can watch it and the song and everything mm -hmm. is at the end we ended the show with that mm-hmm uh, and uh, again, you know, when it comes to hip hop, you might be the you might be the hip hop correspondent because also you covered Jam Master Jay's I did. scenario. Yeah, I was at the funeral. I was at Jam Master Jay's funeral in New York, uh, filming B roll of all the other rap luminaries and celebrities and people that were there. And my buddy uh, Hannibal, who produced the show I told you about in New York, uh, uh -huh. Ghetto mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I interviewed him about the case. But the thing about Jam Master Jay's case was, and now the Ronald Washington and the right. other guy are now on trial for that murder, mm -hmm. you know, know, 20 years later, basically. Yeah, but from the night it happened, the police knew who did it. Really? Yes. Ronald Washington was named and ID'd by people in the studio, but then the stop snitching thing drew everybody back and everybody shut up. Really? Meanwhile, Ronald wow. Washington got 17 years on an armed robbery bid and was put away. Oh, he'd been away from... Yeah. For, oh, okay. Ron Washington been, been locked up for a long time. Okay, okay. And so there were just some new developments in the case finally. Like the fact that Jay had actually... What they're saying in the trial now is that he had paid for 10 pounds of cocaine. Right, sure. And that these two guys, Washington and Morning. the other dude, thought they were they were part of the deal. Right. And the, the, the coke was supposed to come down to Maryland and they thought they were going to make $200,000 off of this. And then Jay cut them out of it. And that's that's what's coming out in the trial. Right, right. That's what's so coming out. there was always suspicion that Jay had some involvement, that drugs had some part in why he got right. killed. And from what I'm seeing in the testimony that's going on right now, it appears that, that that probably was the case. But but why sometimes these high profile murders of rappers from Tupac to Biggie to the Jam take so long to get uh, or that sometimes Look, man, it don't it's, never go? Like it's, it's culture. Look at this. Megan the Stallion gets shot in both feet, right? Okay. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Half the people on Twitter and Instagram are mad at her for having the man who shot him both right, feet right. tried and convicted. That's the part of the problem. I did a whole thing, a story for AMW on the whole stop snitching movement back when Carmelo Anthony got mm -hmm, in trouble mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. trying to say people shouldn't snitch. And right. Snitching, look, it's dangerous. You live in the hood. Let's say you live in, in Barry Farms or somewhere right. deep in Anacostia or somewhere in Northeast or Sersum Quarter. And you know who killed somebody. You also know that coming forward is is a life or death decision. 
You know, there was a guy who got killed in Southeast a few years ago. And after he died, people in the neighborhood started telling the police of all the people he had killed in the neighborhood. It was at least four homicides that people said, oh, he's the one that did that. But nobody said anything when he killed the first person right. or when he killed the second, second one. Person, right. So four families right. lost a loved one to this dude because nobody would do anything. But then again, the police can't. That's, it's not like on TV where you just, oh, we'll put you in witness protection. You'll move to Montana and you'll get a new job and identity. Right. That's not how it goes most right. of the time. Right. So I understand it. But we can't really solve homicides and crimes in the black community, especially in the inner city communities, if people aren't going to testify. And that's just the but, but reality. What's the I mean, that sounds good. but it, what, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I, one thing my mother always said was, if you don't know, say you don't know. Right. And when it comes to this problem, I really I don't, don't know. know. Do do you think uh well you say you think they got, they they got the right people yeah yeah because mm-hmm. I was uh, you know I could I have a friend of mine that's very close to to him um you know it's funny some of his friends don't want to believe that he was moving weight Jay yeah, yeah uh-huh. Jay yeah, yeah. some uh-huh. of Jay's friends like no nah, he wasn't doing no drugs but you know from what I'm hearing too from other people mm-hmm. that that's what it was mm-hmm. um it's funny back to like you said you you you're on the I didn't realize this that this this is something people may not realize. Mm-hmm. That Jam Master J wasn't signed to the record company. Did you know that? It was no, no. It was um, Run DMC, them two, whatever, them two. Yeah, Darryl, they were right Darryl there. and Run. When, right when they were about to go on tour, they needed a DJ. When well, they already had the album ready, they needed a DJ to go, and they hired him. So he was cut out of the royalties of, the, of records and stuff. Really? So he made his money DJing with them. I did not know that. That's what you're here for. We're doing the panic room. Yeah, thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you for that. So, so yeah. yeah, so that's probably one of the reasons he had to hustle right. extra. You know what I'm saying? That Do would make extra, more yeah. sense. Yeah. That would make more sense because mm-hmm. I always thought, well, why would somebody as rich as Jam Master mm-hmm. J in the record business no, sir. need to move move weight? Wait, right, right. You no, know? no, he's trying to keep his company afloat. Mm. You know, I think he had Onyx and some other people on, mm-hmm. on there. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and like I said, people saw it. It's just, wow, just wow. Um, but I'm glad uh, the, the, the trial is going on now, so we mm-hmm. haven't gotten a verdict. Yeah. Probably by the time y'all mm-hmm. see this, may have a, a verdict. Mm-hmm. Um, a shame it took 20 years, you know. Um, at least his family, Jay's family, they're having their day and they're shot at justice. Right. And that's, for me, that's been one of the most important things in my work I've done over the decades. When I got on Live PD and I realized we have three solid hours every Friday, Saturday night, I said, look, can we use a couple of minutes of each show to profile missing kids with National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in a collaboration with them? Can we profile fugitives that are wanted from some of the departments that we're riding with and others or crimes that make the news that week that are caught on tape that they're right. trying nice. to catch? So oh, during the course of the four years uh, we were doing Live PD, we caught 32 fugitives nice. and recovered something like 12 missing kids. And then I spun they spun off a show for me called mm-hmm. Live PD Wanted for two seasons. Mm-hmm. I did 22 episodes of that. Profiling fugitives. So for me, trying to get people off the street that should be locked up. Right. I don't. I'm not about anybody being railroaded into jail. Sure. But if you are definitely the person that did this crime, mm-hmm. I have no problem with trying to do right. everything I can with my talents as a journalist to put you put you in right. jail sure. and get your victims justice. However, whatever sure. form that comes in for them. Sure. 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 No. Mm-hmm. No. No. That, 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 that's um, that's applaudable. Um, what are you doing now? Are you looking for another show, or we'll create something? Yeah, I'm pitch- I'm pitching a show that I created uh, right at the end of AMW on back in 2011, mm-hmm. and I've been pitching this show now for that long, that like long, 11, 12 years. I think I'm close. Um, I'll, you'll see when, when yeah. I right. I'll make sure that you know when All I right. get that green light right. and we're in production. But uh, and I, you, some people may recognize me from infomercials uh, right. regarding identity theft protection. Um, I've done commercials for on. I'm gonna tell my fans: look out for Tom Morris Jr. in locking niggas up <laughs> on ABC. <laughs> no, make it Fox. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. No, that won't be the title of my show. <laughs> <Right>. But <laughs> no, what 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 it should be? Because I'm an equal opportunity fugitive. I know that. I'm it it right. could be I'm everybody. <laughs> I think it's black, white, Mexican, they all the same. Yep. Um, what I'm gonna say is, um, you know, when I was doing some research on you, boy. You are fire in the kitchen. Oh, you saw the meal. What the fuck? What, what, damn, <laughs> locking people up. Oh, open a restaurant, man. That ain't your food. No, it is, actually. You, I you, started you make all those things on your page. Everything you see on my Instagram page. Go to his IG page. 
It, it's, wow. Uh, I cook almost every day. Um, like when I was working all the time. Now I'm, I'm sort of semi-retired since right. IPD ended in 2020. Sure. So I've been home cooking. My wife's still running her business, going to work. Oh. I'm home and I'm cooking. And the reason I became uh, good in the kitchen, I'd say, is because when my parents got married and then my mom, my mom had me, she stopped going to college, but she swore she was going back. So when we moved back to Virginia, she went back to Virginia Union my junior in high school and lived on campus. So my father, he's a minister, he's busy. Mm. So I had to cook for myself and my brother and my sister. Mm. And that's how I learned how to cook. And I learned mm. from my grandmother, my grandfather, and I just well, been cooking ever since. Well, I cook too, but not, man, you, man, Jesus. I'm, let's put it this way. Uh, we got each other's number. It might mm -hmm. be over sometime. I'm going to invite you over. Don't do me I like swear. that, bro. I'm going to invite on, you over, man. man. No, I'm going to lay it out for you. You, you, lay, lay, you, lay, you lay something out? You lay, lay it out right. for you. Well, look, I got a couple of things we do on our show before we uh, get off the show. Uh -huh. right, we do a thing called IG Creeping here, mm -hmm. okay, on, on the show. So I go to your IG page where my crew does, and we pick out pictures and, you know, see what you was up to, you know, mm -hmm. what was happening there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, let's, let, let's see what we got. All right. This first picture... What the hell? Is that straight D.C. right there? Because I don't know if y'all know that, but Obama is Obama. And it, well, it, uh, okay, so that's a mayonnaise that comes from, I think, Mississippi. And so I I go to Aldi a lot, right? Okay. And I'll find good deals at Aldi, and I'll mm -hmm. post like, hey, they got Duke's mayonnaise, right, right. the whole big joint, right? right. For like three ninety nine. So I started asking people on IG, send me pictures of the mayonnaise that you use. Okay. Your region, right. your, what's in your foot, your family's always used to make potato salad. Sure. So people started sending me, and somebody sent me this and said, hey, this is what Bama. we Down in Mississippi, we rock with Bama. I was like, well, in D.C., we call a Bama right, somebody right. can't right. dress or something. But I was like, hey, that's, it's actually Alabama. That's where it's from. Oh, that's what it is? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You don't have no Bama yeah. Uh, yeah. mayo yeah. You know, And it's good. DC. It's it good. Yeah. I don't, I don't do white sauce. Oh, boy, look at you, man. I just want to clean what the? That, where, where we going? Where we going there? This is a Morris. This is a Morris man. Look, my father, my grandfather, all of us. We all wear hats. We all nice. We, this is a, that's a Morris man look, and oh, that, was, okay. that was that uh, was in Vegas last April. Because nice. when I go to Vegas, I go Rat Pack style. I don't, you know, I know that's right. You I ain't clean, going like boy. I'm going to the Lions game. You, I know that's right. you clean. <laughs> what we have going on here with this? That is my mother, who is oh, nice. 89. My father right. started a radio broadcast in Tappahannock, Virginia, the home of Chris Brown. Okay, I know, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's called the Sunday Morning Inspiration Hour. And last year we celebrated 50 years of it being on the air. My father passed away in 2011, but my mother has been coming on the show for 50, now 51 years, doing... Uh, Announcements from the various churches around the region for that weekend, for that Sunday. Beautiful, man. And huh? uh, she's... Uh, yeah, man. She's, looks nice. A beautiful yeah, mother, too, That's man. my mother. I know that's right. What that's Eleanor. Okay. Shout out to Eleanor. Shout out to Eleanor. Boy, look at you. Boy, look, look like you're 21 years old in that picture. Man, what's my... And that shirt is a is a in ground. shirt too. Yeah, spray ground. Yeah, I, I rock with spray ground. Yeah. Look at you, boy. Look at you. What yeah. we got? We got, got the L. We going to L. Cool J concert. I had to. So now you got to bust Versace. You I know, know that's right. That's just how it is. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> so you just got to bust like the Versace. Yeah, you from DC. You, know? you got you got to roll like yeah. that. I love it. All right. <laughs> what we got to go? Oh, look at that. That's you? my youngest son, Justice. He was oh. five years old, and at the top cop awards that they have in DC every year. Um, 2001, all the officers and firemen had died in 9-11. Oh, wow. And we were, at America's Most Wanted, we would produce this top cop show. So there's a part in the show where they show the names of all the fallen officers that year. Right. And that year was an especially long list. And they bring out a little boy, about five years old, in a New York uh, NYPD police uniform, mm -hmm. oversized, and while they roll the fallen officers' names on the screen, he comes out, stands there in the spotlight, nice. and just holds the salute through the whole thing. So this is my, my most terrifying moment as a parent. So we, we're at the Warner Theater, right. okay? Right. My five-year-old son is about to walk out on the stage, and he's got to do what he's got to do. Right. And I'm sitting there. But this was him backstage with uh, the famous, late, great uh, actor and comedian, Richard Belzer. Richard Belzer, without mm -hmm. a doubt. And um, your son killed it. He did. He did. He nailed it. There it and is. and after the show, it was so funny. We were outside the Warner Theater, and some other little kids that had been in the show, they saw him and they go, "That salute boy! Yeah, yeah, Can nice. we get your autograph?" And my son's it. literally five years old, <laughs> signing autographs on I the program. It. Yeah, I, I love it. His I, name is Justice. Justice. Because when he was born, 
In 96, I was working for AMW, and I worked for Justice for People, and I named him Justice. Beautiful. Beautiful. I feel like... What that boy? Look at like like the Rat Pack there, boy. That's and that's big. And that big. That's real. That right there. I did a feature story for AMW on Mills Lane. Mills Lane. Mills my man, Lane, the, the boxing, boxing referee. Yes. This is before the ear bite with Tyson and Holyfield. Right. And he was. Let's uh, get he, it on. Yeah, and he was mm -hmm. a judge in Reno, Nevada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I went out there to do a feature on him. He's the one that taught me how to hit the speed bag. Okay. I learned how to do speed sure. bag from Mills Lane in okay. his basement. Okay. And um, we became good friends. And I remember. Good, we were filming with him in his office, and he uh, was opening his mail while we were changing shot around. And he opened a letter from an envelope from Don King, and it was a check for a fight he had just done. He said, "Time, I tell you one thing: I can say what you want about Don King, but his checks don't bounce." I know that's right. I know that's <laughs> right. Yeah, but yeah, man, God, God rest his soul, man. Boy. So I decided since it was it was like you know bright lights, Reno. Right. I'm a I'm gonna do my stand up in a in a tuxedo. Matter of fact. Quick story. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the stand-up with my <laughs> crew on the strip. Some drunk guys come by, and one of them walks between me and the camera. Mm -hmm. And I'll paraphrase what I said to him. I said, listen, I will take this microphone off <laughs> and beat your oh, ass right, if right, you right, do yeah. this again. Yeah. Okay? Because right. I was just like, yeah, yeah. And you look like you would do that in that picture, too. Yep. You like one of the, like the enforcers, like Sonny Liston. Remember him? Train every day. <laughs> right. Train every day. Beautiful. Boy, look at your boy. What is what now, we got I'm going known on here? for rocking the... camo. Uh, is that what it is? I rock a lot of camo. And this particular, uh, my wife got me this camo bathrobe for Christmas last year. And I was like. A, a child in a candy store. Look at yeah, you. Really did, you really did start creeping on my IG. You bust out the camo yeah, robe. Hell yeah. Oh, snap. A, 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 but we can't just show that. We got to show that. Ooh, look oh. at that boy! Look at that right there! What that's the hell? Where I had to make chicken and waffles myself. I threw some green, some greens. And what's that some, up top? What's that up top? Uh, that's some uh, scallop potatoes. Woo! Scallop potatoes, collard greens, chicken and waffles. Is that like just something you did, or is it like a special event? You know, for your I, wife I'll or decide things like I want to make. Like yesterday, I made curry meatballs nice. with cabbage. Damn. My wife made butternut squash and Ooh. acorn squash. Oh, come on now. And we just had like vegetables and curry meatballs, you know? I'm digging that. Hold on. I, I got more food. Damn. Mm. Boy, right. like a re I, I from a restaurant, man. You lying. Now, come on. What salmon, restaurant salmon. you went to? Pan seared, pan seared blackened salmon on a salad. And I throw a lot of things in there. Cilantro and Parmesan cheese and uh, red onions, white onions, spinach, lettuce. Come on I, now. Yeah. You, you, ain't, you ain't playing. Whoa, look at that. With the beans, too? The beans look like they fire. I, I call that black bean medley. I mixed about four different kinds of beans. I put them in some tomato sauce, light tomato sauce, simmer them down. And I've actually mm. served that at church to when we have men's, men's, uh, men's, there's a day every Sunday right, where sure. men make dishes for the church, and I, I make that a lot. What's that meat? That is uh, chicken. I marinated that for about three days, and then I uh, grilled it on the grill. And you got your spinach. I eat a lot of spinach. I I, 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 like I don't ever too. eat veg, uh, meals without dinner without vegetables. It's funny. I actually eat more vegetables than meat mm. on my on my plate. You know, but yeah. I love it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I make that. Mm -hmm. Good lord, yeah. man. All right, then, man. All right, before we leave, um, we do a little game here. It's called spin the wheel, and wherever mm. it lands at, I know wherever it lands mm -hmm. at, and you spin in the wheel too. You well, gotta I'm participate. Spinning. Okay. My fans already know what's already on here. I ain't gonna right. keep on repeating it. Okay. So I, I need a, I need a good DC Virginia DMV spin, and where it lands now, you got to participate in. It. All right. Y'all okay. ready? Give a drum roll. Get a drum roll. <laughs> yeah, spin it. Spin it hard. Oh, but hold on. Spin, spin it again, man. Yeah, that thing go got around all the way, man. One whole time. Put some. Put some. There you go. Ooh. Okay, we'll take that. What, what, right. what that fall on to? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. What is that? Now your wife's gonna watch the show. All right, let's spin it, 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 again. It, it, yeah, yeah, you might want to spin it again. Right. <laughs> you gotta get me a good. Yeah, 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 cause she might not want to. Yeah, 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 you gotta get a real spin and go. Ooh, there we go. Wait, let's see where it is. All right, get it off your chest. We can go with that right there. Now think of something that you want to get off your chest. You type society, just please, this thing, whatever. How you feel about anything, man. The, Think about. the internet is turning people into absolute idiots. It was supposed to make people smarter. It was supposed to give them far more access to solid, usable information. And it is turning people into idiots. I just had a conversation with a guy I get my firewood from for the last 30 years at his farm. When he tried to tell me Elvis was still alive, Ooh. 
The governor, the government has captured mermaids and is hiding it from us. And then he said something political to which I said something I, in the name of Jesus, I right. shouldn't have said right, to him. Right, right. But my relationship with that farm for wood, 30 years is over. The wood over. ain't no good. <laughs> it's over. The wood ain't no good. But him and his brothers, right. you can't tell them the stuff they see on the internet isn't true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it's funny you said too. I thought I told somebody about, about that too. I had no idea how crazy folks were until the internet was discovered. Mm -hmm. You know, you see people they talk like they have some sense, or mm -hmm. they watch their mouth around you. But online, nope. when the internet got in, got got involved, I had no idea. I didn't know every woman thought she was the finest thing in the world. Yeah. I don't care what she looked like. You know, what I'm saying she gonna strut her shit up front, of, or and people would say stuff and threaten you on yeah. something they would never do in person. Little things. I posted a picture of me. Uh -huh. In uh, Milwaukee with a cameraman the other day from 2009. Okay. It was when I did the murder of Lala Brown, the Army I, I remember, yeah, killed. yeah. I had I worked on that case. On here. Yeah, mm -hmm. Lala Brown. Mm -hmm. Like Jennings, yeah. Yeah, I like Jennings. And uh, I posted, posted a picture of me and my cameraman from, from that shoot in Milwaukee and just said, What city am I in? One person responded, Well, you're not in California because you're smiling. Oh, wow. And I wanted to say, and you've never shopped on Rodeo Drive. <laughs> 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 but I didn't because right. I don't give my opinions on the Internet. Oh, I do not. Yeah. You will never see an opinion from Tom Morris Jr. on the Internet. Okay. Period. Okay. I'll tell you I'm glad the Ravens won right. or something like that. Right. Or salute to right. UVA for winning the national championship. Right. But I do not give my opinions. And, and why don't you? Just, just don't First of all, there's enough people doing it. There's enough people what? There's enough people doing it. Oh, doing it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> There's right. way too many already doing right, it. Right. I may have some unique perspectives, but somebody else has got the same ones too, and they're saying it somewhere on TV or the internet. Okay. So I, I just, I, I don't need, I, I don't need to be haunted by saying something that's gonna make a whole bunch of people hate me right. <laughs> at this point in life. Right. I just don't need it. You I know. Come on. Look, Tom, man, I am. And, and, and do you have any nieces or nephews? I do. Yes. So huh? you actually are Uncle Tom. I, I'm oh. saying I'm, 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 well, I'm, they've I'm, all been instructed. <laughs> they've all been instructed from an early age. Right, I'm Uncle that. T. I'm Uncle Tommy. I love it. But you will that. not Never call me Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm messing with you, bro. You know how I am. Bro. Yes, sir. I appreciate you coming. We also do a thing called we give a swag bag. People don't always oh. do that, man. Give little gifts away. Oh, Pull out snap. the products and look at them. Man. It's all black owned. This check is, it out. Yeah, check your, it out. This yeah, is your book too. Man, I got a, a book. I wrote a call. You pull it out. Yeah, look at it. Yeah. Oh. It's called my 100 homies and phonies of Hollywood. So all the celebrities I met in Hollywood who was real, who wasn't. It's in there. Word. Oh, my opinion, yep. What oh, is this? You know what? That's my damn... I mean, give me No, give me that. Hold on. No, hey, hey, we've been looking for that. That's my uh, my, my SD card. <laughs> damn it. I know I brought it with me. Nigga. I, couldn't find, I couldn't find my damn SD card. Written. Okay. Damn, I, it. damn it. I want $1,500. Hell, I've been looking for this sucker. <laughs> All right. oh, I love come, this. There you go. Come on. Thank panic you. Room. Thank there you. Come panic on, room. Panic room. Uh, panic room. There you Coffee go, room. boy. Come on now. Oh, you know we in the right. house. That's a that's a do rag. I don't know. A rag. Yeah, I or rock, I rock thing. it underneath yeah. for cap. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pop that out if you word, want to. Word. And this is my. That's the that's the, the best crown right jewel right here. Look how soft this, it is. Oh, it's slim fit. It's slim fit too. Is this Vietnamese cotton? What? Oh, yeah, nice. Very nice. It might be. Look at soft too. Oh man. Slim fit. It's a large. You a large? I'm a large. There you go. Look at that boy. Thank you so much, Pierre. Man, no. Hey, oh, Tom, man. I really appreciate you coming on the thank show, brother. Thank you, thank I, you. I, when my boy approached me to, about you, I was like, all right, let me look into it. After I looked, I started Googling you, looking into you, I was like, what a fascinating life you've lived. You've been through a lot of stuff, man. And to be here still shining, man, is a beautiful thing, brother. And I mm -hmm. hope my fans really appreciate the stuff you've done, you know, um, just you know, career-wise and brought some people to justice that needed to be, you know, justice. Mm -hmm. And even still today, still wanting to do some of that kind of stuff, man. So I really, really appreciate it, man. You know, I really, really do, man. So thank you. Thank you so your, much. Your social media, if you want to tell the social media to the people right there. That, At IG, The Real Tom Morris Jr. The Real Tom Morris Jr. 1 on IG. And Tom Morris, Jr. 1 on X. Yo, man, again, like I said, thank you so much for coming. Yo, thank y'all for watching. I told you to go. You have no guests, man. You don't even know who they are. You find out, bam, so much about it, man. So mm -hmm. thank you again for coming. Thank y'all for watching. Uh, and thank y'all for stopping. Don't forget to hit the notification bell. Tell folks or hit the subscribe button, man. You know, the show's growing, growing. Last month, we did about 15,000 new subscribers, y'all. Damn, thank you so, so much, man. We're growing, we're growing. Again, thank you guys. And um, I'll holler at y'all later, all right? There it is. Right there. And don't forget to see my movie Slice. It's on Tubi right now. There it is.
I'm Tom Morris Jr., and I survived Pierre's panic. Mm. If you like that show, like, subscribe, and comment below. You know, hit the, hit the notification bell. Hit the subscribe button, man. We want you around. Appreciate it.